Hello, New Vision. My name is Dexter Upshaw, and I have the privilege and the honor of serving as a senior pastor here at New Vision International Ministries. They call me Pastor Dexter, and I'm so grateful to be with you today. I'm not physically here, but I'm with you in spirit. I'm actually currently physically in Virginia. I'm preaching for New Life Church Loudoun. They're celebrating their third anniversary. We're with Pastor Dustin Sullivan and his wife, Lady Kiasha, and Bishop, and Pastor Sharon. And I'm certain we're having a good time. But I'm also certain that you are having a good time here at 35 Benham Avenue. If you're in the house, make some noise. If you're watching online, drop something in the chat. Because God has a word for you today. And this is what I love about technology. I can be away and still be here because we've got this series that we're working through. And I want to make sure that we are able to uh, continue in our thread of thought. But before we get into the word, shout out to all of you who are here who are repping your culture. I know earlier they had you hype on your feet, representing your island, representing your country. That's what I love about New Vision. We're so diverse. Some of you are asking me, what am I repping today? I was born in Shreveport, Louisiana. I was raised in Texas. I live in Connecticut. My mama's from Texarkana, Texas. Her family's from Arkansas. My father's from Shreveport, not Shreveport, Leesville, Louisiana. His father's from Mississippi. His mother's from East Texas. I say all that to say that I'm proud to be an American. So I'm wearing red, white, and blue. That's the nation that I'm representing today. What the beautiful thing about this is that we're all coming together and we are a royal priesthood and a chosen generation that our differences don't divide us in the body of Christ. No, our differences bring us together because the body has many members and we're all team Jesus in this place. So if you are team Jesus, I just need you to stand to your feet Take one more opportunity to lift your voice like a trumpet and say thank you for the blood of Jesus. Your country might be yellow, black, and green. Another's country might be red, white, and blue. But the blood of Jesus is red, and we're grateful for that. If you could please remain standing. If you can't stand, if you're physically able to stand, we're going to stand for the reading of God's word. Today our text is coming from Matthew chapter 6. Starting with verse 19, Matthew chapter 6, starting with verse 19, as you grab your scripture, just a reminder, we're in our love song series. For those of you who are here for the first, second, or third time, for the past couple of months, each message has borrowed a lyric or a title from a love song, and the whole point of this series is to develop a deeper love relationship for God, and we are learning God's love language, and we're learning how to love him. We've learned about the importance of praise and worship. We've learned about the importance of prayer and devotion. And we're concluding this series by learning the importance of giving gifts, the importance of our ability to give to God as an expression of our love for him. And so today we're going to take Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, and it reads, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But... Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. If, therefore, your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. And therefore, the light that is in you is darkness. How great it is. Here's a verse, verse 24. No one, tell somebody, nobody, 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 no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot, there's no way you can serve God and mammon. For he will either hate one and love the other or be loyal to one and despise the other. 
You cannot serve God and mammon. This is the word of the Lord. The church said, amen. Amen. Today I want to teach from the topic. It's a thin line between love and hate. Before you take your seat, tell somebody, it's a thin line between love and hate. You may be seated. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for every person that's here. Physically, everyone that's on our online campus, that you have melded this moment. You have brought us together, dear God, that even though this message is pre-recorded, there's an appointed thing that you're doing here that the time is now for us to hear this word. May this word jump off of the pages and jump out of the screen into the hearts of your people. Lord, that we would learn how to give to you the way that you want to receive. And Father, I pray that you would anoint me now, dear God, to speak to my congregation, to be a shepherd that leads his congregation to green pastures. Thank you, Jesus, for being my shepherd. Thank you, Father, that that which I preach and teach is not just helpful for those who listen. It's also helpful for me. Help us all, dear God, to love you the way that you want to be loved. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Somebody say amen. Last Sunday, we discussed the biblical origins of tithes and offering. We explored how the practice of tithes and offering actually begins in the book of Genesis. The first recorded offering was found in Genesis chapter 4 with Cain and Abel. We learned that God accepted Abel and his offering, but he rejected Cain and his offering. And we understood that, one, God can reject what we offer to him. And if he rejects what we offer, he's actually rejecting us because where your treasure is, there your heart is also. We also talked about last week how the first tithe recorded in Scripture was in the book of Genesis between Abraham and a king named Melchizedek that Abraham took a tenth of all of his wealth and gave it. And so we see this practice of tithes and offering early in Scripture, and it actually predates what we understand as the Mosaic Law. And we delved into the Mosaic Law to understand what the requirements for giving were under that law, that the tithing system was a very complicated system. In fact, there were three types of tithes. There was the Levitical tithe. There was the festival tithe, and then there was the charity tithe. Collectively, you were giving at least 23% of your wealth to the Lord as a tribute to him, as a duty, as an obligation. Then on top of that, there were instructions concerning offerings, and there were at least 10 different types of offerings. There were wave offerings, heave offerings, guilt offerings, meal offerings, drink offerings. There were all these different offerings, and The people of God under the law were required to give according to those laws. But then we learned that we are no longer under the law because Jesus came and fulfilled the law. We are now under a new covenant, but we are not under the Mosaic law. And so when we give, it's not because we are under the law, but we are under love. We give because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. We give out of a love relationship with God. And so it's important to note that when it comes to giving and generosity as the modern day church, we operate based on principle, not policy. It's principle over policy that when we give is not because we're following a law, it's not because we're following something prescribed in scripture, Down to the T, we're giving out of principle. We give because we see the practice before the law. We see the practice during the law. And now that we have been liberated, we're liberated to really give freely unto the Lord and to give cheerfully to him. So here are two principles that guide our giving. Number one, that our first and our best is holy and it belongs to God. That as often as we receive wealth, and for us, it's a paycheck. For us, it's cash money. Whenever money comes into our life, because we love God, we give him our first and our best. We believe that that first and that best is devoted to God. It belongs to him. It's holy. And we do that because we trust him as provider. And we get to choose what we give to him. That tithe means tenth, but we're not limited to percentages. 
We are trying to hear from the Holy Spirit and we make a decision and we make a commitment to give to the Lord our first and our best. And we do it cheerfully, not with compulsion. And then we're also learning the principle of giving sacrificially above and beyond our first and our best. That it is good for us to give an offering to the Lord above and beyond. That there are times in our life where the Spirit will prompt us to give above and beyond. That we give sacrificially as an act of loyalty to God. Now despite all of this evidence and all of this teaching and the careful movement down this process of understanding what it means to love God and to give of ourselves to him and to give tangibly, there are some of you who are still hesitant to give. And I get it. And I know you've been nodding throughout this whole series. For some of you, the way we've explained tithes and offerings is different than anything you've ever heard before. And it's actually liberating because now you have understanding and you know in your head why it's important for you to give to the Lord, but you still haven't been able to reach into your pocket. There's still part of you that's hesitant because of the grip that money has on your life. We're going to deal with that today. It's okay to admit that we like what money can do for us. Somebody say amen. It's okay to admit that we like what money can do for us. Money allows us to pay our rent and to pay our mortgage. Money allows us to put our kids in school and pay for their tuition. Money allows us to go get something to eat after service. Money allows us to maybe pursue the lifestyle that we desire. We have a vision for how we want to raise our kids and the type of environment we want them in and the type of neighborhood we want them to live in. And when you have access to financial resources, you can do what you choose to do and what you want to do. Money allows us to buy the clothes that we want to wear. Money allows us to pursue the properties that we want to acquire. Money gives us the option to go places that we want to go and to travel across the world or travel across the country to have experiences that are meaningful to us. Money allows us to go and purchase the foods that we want to taste. Listen, it's okay and necessary for us to buy things. It's okay and necessary for us to purchase things. And even within the house of God, everything that's around us has a financial cost to it. I'm standing on a stage. When we built this stage from scratch, we had to go to Home Depot. We had to get lumber. That lumber costs money. These wonderful cushion chairs that many of you, they're so comfortable that you fall asleep Sunday after Sunday. These cushioned, double-wide, red chairs, they were they were expensive, right? Because we wanted to invest because we knew that we'd be spending a lot of time. The cameras, the LED wall, all of these things cost money. And so there are times where it's necessary and good to spend money. The question is, what position in our heart does money have? Money is a useful tool and a poor master. And we're going to get to that in just a second, but I, I want to be very clear. Here's what we're not doing. Tell somebody we're not pocket watching. We are not pocket watching. And I've mentioned pocket watching a few times. I was just introduced to the term within the past year because it's one of those Gen Z terms. When you're watching a podcast and the interview keeps on asking the guest about their net worth, asking the guest about their material possessions, that's what we call pocket watching. Pocket watching is the act of monitoring or speculating about another person's lifestyle and money habits, watch this, usually out of envy. And we all are susceptible to pocket watching. You see somebody with a new car, you start the question, can they afford that? But really what you're saying is, I like it, but I don't have it. It's what they used to call keeping up with the Joneses when somebody across the street got a new toy, got a new vehicle, and the neighbors were looking. And now that person has the nicest car on the block and people became envious, keeping up with the Joneses. So what would they do? They would go down to the dealership and they would get a car that's just above the car of their neighbor so they could drive around and feel like they were in charge of the block. Envy. How often have we purchased things, bought things, spent money for the wrong reasons? So I need you to know this isn't about pocket watching. Pocket watching is rooted in 
envy. And that's why we can't get caught up, even within the church, judging other people's purchases. That's between them and the Lord. I hope they have a budget, but that's between them and the Lord. I hope they are saving. I hope they're giving. But guess what? We ain't pocket watching. God is watching your pockets, but we're not pocket watching. Ultimately, a person and what they choose to spend is between them and the Lord. But what we have to make sure that we are is content because pocket watching is rooted in envy. Want to know what the opposite of envy is? Contentment. Contentment is when you can be happy for somebody else and their blessing because you know that God's got you. Contentment is when you are secure in who you are and what God is doing in your life. And you don't have to have the latest because your identity is not based in your material possessions. Your identity is based in the Lord. Our goal ought to be contentment. When you're content, you're satisfied with what you have. When you're content, you're satisfied with what you got. The great psalmist, William Devon, not Curtis Mayfield, said it this way in 1974. Though you may not drive a great big Cadillac, gangster white walls, TV antennas in the back, you may not have a car at all. But remember, brothers and sisters, you can still stand tall. Diamond in the back, some rooftop, digging in the scene with a gangster lean, woo-hoo. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. See, that's that 70s anointing that just jumps on me every once in a while. Diamond in the back, some rooftop, digging in the scene with a gangster lean. See, the song is actually about contentment. You don't have to have a car to be content. You don't have to envy what somebody else has. You may not have the Cadillac with the white walls. You may not have the newest ride. You may not have the nicest piece of jewelry. You may not have the newest pair of Jordans. You may not have the new iPhone. But you got to be thankful for what you've got. You ought to take a moment right now to thank God for what you've got. Whether it's a bus pass or a Toyota, thank God for what you've got. Whether it's spaghetti or steak, thank God for what you got. You might be going home to oodles and noodles, but you better take that oodles and noodles, put it in a microwave, take it out, put some hot sauce in it, bless it, and thank God for what you've got. Whether you've got $5 in your pocket or $5,000 in the bank, you've got to learn how to give thanks. Tell somebody, be thankful for what you have. And half the stuff they're producing nowadays is not even built well. It's built to fail. Planned obsolescence. They've got us chasing money and chasing stuff that's all going to pass away. And there comes a point in your life, in your walk with Jesus, where you're just happy to be saved. And you're just happy to know the Lord. And you're just happy to be in your right mind. And you're just happy to have something to eat. And you're just happy to have a table to sit at. You're happy to have a place to lay your head. It may not be yours, but it's a place where you can lay down and you can find peace. That surpasses all understanding because Jesus is the one that's protecting you. Jesus is the one that's keeping you. The Lord is the one that's providing for you. We ought to give thanks. It's not even Thanksgiving yet. But you ought to give thanks now. You're waiting for the turkey. You're waiting for the dressing. You're waiting for the candied yams. You're waiting for the cornbread. You're waiting for the collard greens. You're waiting for the sweet potato pie. And God says you don't have to wait until the last Thursday in November. You can give thanks right now. And in my right nine, give thanks. I've got good people around me. Look around. You got some good people around you. Give thanks. The Apostle Paul wrote it this way in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am in. And to give you some context in this passage, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church, and the church is supposed to be supplying his needs and supposed to be sending some money, some financial resources that the people are supposed to be generous in order to underwrite the ministry. But this particular church has not sent what they were supposed to send. But Paul said, it's all good. You should be given and you're not. But I've learned something and I'm speaking not from a place of want. I'm not speaking because I need something from you. Because if I've got God, I've got everything that I need. I've learned how to be content in whatever circumstances I am in. 
He also said, I know how to get along with humble means. And I know how to live in prosperity. And in any and every situation or circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him, Christ, who strengthens me. I've learned how to survive the tough times. The Apostle Paul is saying, I know what it's like to be broke. I know what it's like to be humble. Have you ever found yourself in a season where your lifestyle is humble? <laughs> your lifestyle is humble. It, it's meager. It, you just got what you got. There's not much to brag about, but let me tell you something. You always got something to brag about. You can boast in the Lord. You may not be able to brag about the type of shoes you're wearing. You may not be able to brag about the type of car you're driving. You may not be able to brag about the type of house that you're looking in or living in, but it's not about bragging about those things. I can't boast in my flesh, but I can boast in the Lord. Uh, uh, he's, he's, he's boasting. He's flexing. His flex is Jesus. <laughs> I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So the Paul, Apostle Paul is saying, I've been broke before and, and Jesus is my strength. I've also been in situations where I've had prosperity. Have you ever had seasons in your life where you had more than enough money in your pocket? Have you ever had seasons in your life where you could swipe the card and you're not worried about how much is on it because you know something is there? Come on. Have you ever had seasons in your life where you've had discretionary income and somebody said, let's go here, let's go there. You didn't have to think about it twice because you knew that you had the resources. Guess what? In those seasons, you need to learn how to be content as well because isn't it crazy how the seasons can change, how you can be balling one day and broke another? That's why you don't boast when you're balling. You don't boast when you're broke. The only thing you boast in is in the Lord because you realize that he's the one who's blessing you. He's the one who's sustaining you. You've got to learn the secret to life. It is contentment. Whatever state I find myself in, whether I'm hungry or have an abundance of suffering need, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm here to let you know you can give if you allow Christ to strengthen you. You can let go of your dollars and give them to the Lord and place it in the master's hand through the power of Christ. See, sometimes you got to put the super on the natural. Your flesh doesn't want to do the things that please God. There's a wrestle between the spirit and the flesh inside of every believer. But this is what I love about the power of the spirit. The spirit can put the super on the natural. And some of us are believing God for supernatural things. When's the last time you asked God for a supernatural ability to give? Lord, even though I'm not feeling it, would you place upon my heart and give me an anointing to do what I know needs to be done to follow after your word and to be obedient to what you're prompting in my heart? I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Some of you are saying there's no way I can take money from my paycheck because I got bills and I got stuff. I hear you. I feel you. But. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. When you want to do the will of God, it is Christ who empowers you, Christ who strengthens you. You can do it if you let Christ do it through you. And here's the crux of the matter. Here it is. Our greatest goal in life should be godliness, not greenbacks. I know they told you it's all about the money. Deion Sanders back in the day had, had a whole song, must be the money. No, no, it's not about the money. It's not all about the Benjamins. It's all about God. Wu-Tang had it wrong. It's not cash that rules everything around me. It's Christ that rules everything around me. When Christ is at the center of my life and godliness is my goal, it's no longer about money. Money shouldn't have more power over you than God has power over you. And we should desire godliness more than we desire that guap, more than we desire that green, more than we desire that money, more than we desire those coins. In fact, the scripture says, what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his soul? What should it profit you to become a millionaire and bust hell wide open? What would it profit you to spend your life chasing after money, chasing after success and to neglect your soul? Part of giving is making sure that your soul is watered, making sure that your soul is anchored in the reality that God is your everything. He's your first. He's your last. He's your everything. So when I give my first, it's because he's worthy. When I give my last, it's because he's worthy. When I give everything, it's because he's worthy. And ultimately, I may not get a nice house. I may not get the diamond in the back, the sun roof top. I may not be digging in the scene with the gangster lean, but I've got eternity. Tell somebody, things might get worse before it gets better, but I've got eternity. 
Uh, I may not get everything I want here on earth, but as long as I've got eternity, I can sleep well at night. I've had a lot of money and I've had not a lot of money, but as long as I have eternity, that's what matters. Our greatest goal in life should be godliness, not greenbacks. Tell somebody, I don't need currency. I need character. That's a word for somebody. You say, Lord, if I could just get a few coins. No, no, God is saying, you don't need currency. You need character because coins without character, coins without character will get you in a worse situation than you're in right now. I don't need currency. I need character. I, I don't need funds. I need favor. You ever had something that you've got to do and the Lord has commissioned you to do it? There are some things that I'm believing God for and they cost big bucks. But what I don't need is funds. I need favor because if I get favor, I get the funding. If I get favor, I get the person that shows up out of nowhere that wants to partner with the deal and make it happen. If I've got favor, I've got everything that I need. They might count me out. I may not have the degrees. I may not have the experience. I may not have the money in the account. But if I've got favor and God is on my side, if God is for me, who can be against me it's the mindset that as long as I've got the favor of God I've got a fighting chance and I'm in position for the miraculous you want favor more than you have funds your funds can run out but when favor is assigned to your life and God is the one distributing it it never runs out I need favor tell somebody I need favor I don't need affluence I need the anointing Oh, I don't need to keep up with the Joneses. I don't need to act like I'm rich. I don't need to try to portray something that I'm not. This is a word for some of us. We're so caught up into appearances. We're constantly on Instagram faking, acting like we're living a certain type of lifestyle that we cannot afford, standing next to cars and taking pictures that aren't even uh, cars that belong to us. We are, we're playing around, trying to make it look like we got something. Learn how to be content. You don't need affluence. You don't need a certain profile. You don't need to wear a certain type of name brand clothing. You need an anointing. And if I'm wearing generic clothes and I'm anointed be careful because when I walk into the room the power of God comes with me if I'm anointed I can walk into certain spheres of influence and other people have verified name brands that are attached to their name but when I've got my name attached to the name above all names (laughs) in the name of Jesus every knee shall bow every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord when I come in his name and when I come with an anointing that comes from his father there's certain things that happen Because I don't need currency, I need character, I don't need funds, I need favor, I don't need affluence, I need an anointing. My greatest goal in life should be godliness, not greenbacks. And that's just scripture. First Timothy chapter 6 verse 6 says, but godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied with contentment. So if I choose to live godly, that means I'm going to say no to things that are wicked, and I'm going to say yes to things of God, and I'm content I'm actually getting ahead because when I'm godly, I'm laying up treasures in heaven where rust and moth can't destroy and thieves can't break in and steal. See, see, you're so concerned about your natural 401k that you've forgotten about your spiritual 401k. You know how you fund your spiritual 401k? Godliness. Come on. You know how you fund your retirement in heaven? Obedience to God's word, godliness with contentment is great gain, that there's an account in heaven that's managing your reward. And when you don't grow weary and well-doing, but in due season you reap a harvest, if you faint not, you're storing up for yourselves treasures in heaven. See, the whole premise of an earthly 401k is that you withdraw, you withhold from your paycheck, you set it aside, then your employer puts some additional funds in there, and you set it aside until an appointed time. And then once you hit a certain age, you're able to tap into that retirement for your last days. Let me tell you something about the retirement of heaven. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Every time you do the right thing, you're adding to your account. Every time you walk in obedience, you're adding to your account. And then God adds blessings to you because you did the right thing. He's in charge of your interests, and he's going to make sure that it's worth your while. And one day you will have a reward in heaven. If you just want to live right. Is there anybody here that just wants to live right? I've gotten to the point where it's less about what type of shoes I wear, what type of clothes I have, or what type of car I drive. What would it profit me to gain? All those things and still miss my reward. I want to live right. Somebody say godliness is actually a means of great gain. Verse 7 says, for we have brought nothing into the world. So we cannot take anything out of it either. Last time I checked, 
Before you arrive, you were in your mother's womb. And naked you came out. And naked you're going to live. I know. They're going to go down to the funeral home. I know. Somebody that loves you is going to pick a suit. I know. Somebody's going to select what type of suit you wear, what type of dress you wear, what type of tie you wear. I know one of your family members is going to do your hair. I know somebody's going to put makeup on you. I know they're going to take one of your heirlooms and place it on you. I know you're going to be at the front of this altar and people are going to walk by and say, oh, don't she look good? <laughs> you know how we are. Who did the body? Look good. They look good, don't they? Just looks like they're sleeping. I know that, but, but, but eventually those clothes are going to deteriorate. Eventually, whatever they put in that casket, and I've seen all types of caskets. I've seen basic caskets. I've seen gold caskets. I've seen caskets with your favorite football team. on. I've seen it all. I've seen caskets for those who serve in the military. I've seen it all. But ashes to ashes, dust to dust. That's what we say before they drop you in the ground. Ashes to ashes and dust to dust. You came in with nothing. You will leave with nothing. Have you ever seen a U-Haul behind a hearse? If you haven't, you've seen one now. <laughs> Do you realize how ridiculous that looks? A hearse behind a U-Haul? Because all the stuff, if it's going to be buried, it's going to rust and rot anyway. Or if it stays in the ground and people know where it is and they know what type of stuff is in that U-Haul, you best believe somebody is tracking and somebody will take their chance to rob that grave <laughs> to get that stuff because they realize you have no need for it when you're underground. Listen to this stat. Did you know that King Tut, the Egyptian pharaoh, was buried with over $1.2 million worth of treasure? See, the Egyptian view of the afterlife and their gods is that when you buried someone, you put their possessions in the tomb with them so that they would have things and stuff in the afterlife. Did you know that King Tut's coffin was made out of pure gold? It wasn't gold plated. It was made out of solid gold. Up to 240 pounds, that's how much it weighed. He was buried with over 200 pieces of jewelry. Did you also know that King Tut was buried with almost 200 pairs of shoes, hundreds of pairs of shoes. But here's what's interesting to me. He was also buried with 130 walking canes. Because when you study King Tut, you realize that he was actually very weak and very frail and had lots of deformities and his legs were deformed and they felt like it would be necessary to put his walking canes in the tomb with him. 130 of them. I just think with me for just one second. Why would I want to bring the reminder of my deformity with me to heaven? I'm going one day. I don't know how this thing is going to end. I'm thankful for the use of my legs. Who knows? One day I might need a wheelchair. If I have a wheelchair, why would I want to take my wheelchair with me to heaven when the scripture says that I will be glorified and the scripture says that I'm going to have a new body, I'm going to have new legs, new feet. So what's the need for a cane in heaven when you're going to have new legs? If you had to deal with dialysis in the earth, why would you want to be buried with your dialysis machine? Why would you want to take that with you? Because when you get to heaven, everything's going to be made new. There will be no disease in heaven. There will be no need for assisted devices in heaven. Are you tracking what I'm saying? You got to get to the point where you realize that heaven is your goal. And ultimately, all this stuff is going to pass away. And when I get to heaven, I will be in the presence of a holy God. So all this stuff that I spent my life pursuing and trying to get and trying to obtain, leave it here. Because there's something better for me in glory according to my scriptures. There's no need for a walking cane in heaven when you have a new body. There's no need for a gold coffin when I'm walking on the streets of gold. There's no need for earthly jewelry when I shall wear a crown. There's no need for me to take my bling bling with me. No, no, no. When I get to heaven, if I live godly, if I do what I'm supposed to do, if I stay focused, if I lock in and I pursue the will of the Father, I'm going to have a crown and that ground, crown is going to have some jewels and, and, and there's going to be a house for me and it's going to be built. If it's built on a solid foundation, I'm going to have a reward that's commensurate with my obedience. Tell somebody you can't take it with you. 
and why would you want to? Verse 7 says, for we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out either. If we have food and covering with this, we shall be content. And I know you might be in between jobs. I know you might be struggling. I know it's hard. I know you're dealing with difficulties. I know. But if you've got food and you've got a place to cover your head, you ought to give God thanks. You ought to give God thanks. With these, we shall be content. I know that's oversimplifying it. But when it's all said and done, if I got something to eat and a place to lay my head and people around me that care for me, I'm a blessed man. But here's the problem. And this is why some of us have difficulty giving up our money to God. Verse 9. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare. And many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So what the scripture is saying that there's a category of people who are content. They're good. But then some people, they're drifting from contentment because they want to get rich. They want to be a millionaire so bad. They want to be successful so bad that they fall into temptation. And then they get trapped in trying to obtain earthly and material success. And this leads into foolish, harmful desires that ultimately ruin families and marriages and ruin people's reputations. And when you look at the news and you see all of these powerful celebrities who've had access to all the money that they could ever want, they could eat what they want, buy what they want, go where they want to go, yet their souls are ruined because they're involved in so much wickedness. The love of money is the root of all sorts of evils and some longing for it. Yes, even within the church, they wander away from the faith and they self-inflict. They pierce themselves with many griefs because of the money. I believe it's the OJs that talked about for the love of money, the love of money. People do weird things. They do, some strange, do something strange for the change even within the body of Christ. So listen, this is what I want you to understand. That money in and of itself is not evil. But the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. Money is just a tool. But when we make money our master and our love for it, our devotion to it, our worship of it, when we start to worship it, get ready for all types of evil to sprout out of your life. Many people have wandered away from the faith, wandered away from the church. There are people who were faithful to God, expressed through his church that the church was a place that was feeding their soul, a place where they were growing in their ministry, a place where they were growing in their witness and their testimony. But because they wanted more money, they, 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 they forsake the assembling together because they've got to make that dollar. They constantly choose work I know I'm stepping on some toes but I'm not here physically you can get get back at me when I get back here physically they, 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 they're so driven by their career that they're constantly saying God I'll get you to you later I'll get to you later I, 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 our calendar has no time in it for the things of God and all I'm saying this is a dangerous place listen to me it's good to have money. It's good to work for money. Business is a good thing. Your job is good, but maybe over time, maybe your constant willingness to say yes to your job while simultaneously saying no to God means that your job and your pursuit of money has become an idol. A strong savings account is good. Stocks and bonds are good. But if you begin to worship them, if you become devoted to them, they can become an idol. Being an entrepreneur is a good thing, but if it causes you to wander from the faith, 
if it causes you to, to have a wedge now between you and your creator, and you're so busy making money that you can't invest time in your relationship with him, then it has become an idol. Jesus said it this way, Matthew 6 and 24, no one, not you or me, can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And some of you are saying, what is mammon? What is mammon? Money and wealth becomes mammon when it becomes the object of our worship and devotion. So in other words, when we start worshiping money, it transforms into an idol when we begin to worship and be devoted to it. And the scripture is very clear. Jesus said it himself. You cannot serve God and mammon. Where your treasure is, there your heart is also. So I'll leave you with this. Who do you love? And are you for sure? And it's tested during offering time. Come on, we get these tests every day. God says, give this. And we say, God, okay, I love you. And then we reach into our pocket or we pull up our app and we hesitate because we like money. Like money, but don't love it. For the love of money is the root of all forms of evil. It's a useful tool, but it is a poor master. We love God more than money. When you give your money to the Lord faithfully, cheerfully, it demonstrates that God is your master and not mammon. That's, for, that's why for many of you, for you and your walk with Christ, this right here, giving of your money, is it's like the ultimate test for you because all your life, the pursuit of money has been the center of who you are and what's important to you. Maybe you grew up in poverty. You didn't have a whole lot. And you vowed that when you came of working age, you were going to get to the place where you never had to ask anybody for anything. That might seem noble, but be careful. That might be pride. You got to the point where you said, I'm going to work harder than everybody else. And hard work is a good thing. But are you trusting in your hard work? Or are you trusting in God? It's a thin line between love and hate. It's a thin line between a healthy relationship with money and money becoming an idol. It's a thin line between love and hate. No man can serve two masters. Either you will love one and hate the other. And here's where we're landing today. I want you to reflect about your relationship with money. And today... It is about giving because giving is that expression of love. It's part of God's love language. But I really want you to reflect on your relationship with money. Has money been an idol in your life? Have you been driven by the pursuit of it? Have you felt yourself at times wandering from the faith? Are you piercing yourselves with much grief, working yourself, your fingers to the bone to earn money that is going to rot when you leave this earth my prayer for you today is that you will break free from the, the grip of mammon that you would be liberated to trust in God fully and that you will allow the Holy Spirit from this moment forward to lead you and guide you in your giving and that every time you give an offering every time you follow the prompting of the Holy Spirit it will once again break another chain in your life because money is a great tool, but a poor master. And we need to be under mastery of nothing but Yahweh himself. So in this moment, there's going to be prayer. And, and I'm going to set this up. And someone from our pastoral leadership team is going to finish it. But I want you to pray about your heart and treasure and your relationship with God in view of money. And I want you to search your heart for mammon. Search your heart for any way that you have put money over God. And that you would ask the Holy Spirit to help you. And I know you got stuff going on. I know you got bills to pay. I know you got to figure some things out. But let God into your situation. That as you give, that it would be 
this, this, this understanding that God is your provider, that, that you will give cheerfully, and that will be part of your process of divesting from the mastery of money over your life. In addition to praying that we will break free from mammon, today we're also going to pray for God to move in our situations, that our love for him, our pure love for him, and this is not a slot machine moment. This is not a moment where we're trying to manipulate the hand of God. No, we're trying to seek the face of God. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, that if you seek his face and seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, that everything else will take care of itself, that you would trust in the Lord concerning your finances and make sure that your love and commitment and devotion is sure. 